In this unit, we're going to look at a bunch of different trig identities. All an identity is, and it's an equation whose left side is equal to the right side, we're going to use them to do a variety of things. We'll use them to rewrite um, different trig expressions in simplest form. We'll use them to verify or prove that one side is equal to another side. And we'll also use them to assist us in solving equations. They'll reappear next year in calculus when we start doing a process called integration, and we'll use them to make simpler integrals that are easier to integrate. Um, but like I said, for now, we'll use them for simplifying, verifying, and solving. So I'm going to give you a whole bunch of them. You will not have to memorize them for my class. You'll just need to be able to recognize and use them. So I tried to put them in different colors here to make them stand out. But if you want to just pause the video and take a minute to look through these, we have the reciprocal identities, which you've seen before. We have something new called co-function identities. I am going to use some class time to prove why these work or to show where they come from, as well as where the even and odd identities come from and why cosine of negative x is just cosine, whereas sine of negative x is just negative sine x. What makes the negative and the cosine go away, but not in the sine? And then our Pythagorean identities. These are going to be the most important. You will need to definitely know this one here, this sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So that I will expect you to know, and you're going to see that most often. Um, one thing to know about all of these different identities is that because they all involve equal signs, we can always rearrange them and write them in different ways. Another thing we need to be aware of is what does sine squared x mean? It means sine of x times sine of x. The reason that we don't write sine with the square on the x is because it's it makes it ambiguous as of, is it the x that's being squared or is it the sine function that's being squared? If we write it this way, we can clearly see that we did write the sine function twice. So like I said, take a moment, go ahead, pause the video, look over these. If you have not printed out a notes template on this video, I would strongly suggest you did rather than spend all the time writing all these different identities out. And if you want to keep those identities handy in front of you, we're going to look at some examples where we use these identities or how some different ways we can use them. And we'll continue to expand on these examples as we continue to work our way through. In the first example, I'm just asked to rewrite in simplest form cosine of negative 2x. Well, I recognize that cosine is an even function. So since the negative isn't necessary, in order to put this in simplest form, all I'm going to do is get rid of that negative and say that that's the same thing as cosine of 2x. On example 2, I'm rewriting in terms of sines and cosines. The well, first thing I notice is that cotangent is the same thing as cosine over sine. So the first thing I would do is say this is the same thing as 1 over cosine of negative x over sine of negative x. And I know that dividing by this fraction would be the same thing as taking this 1 and multiplying it by the reciprocal of this fraction. So I'm going to have 1 times sine of negative x over cosine of negative x. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So 1 times sine of negative x all over cosine of negative x. And lastly, again, because I always want to put things in simplest form, I notice that cosine of negative x as an even function, that negative is not necessary. I can just rewrite that as cosine of x. The negative on the sine I can pull out front. So I'm going to write my simplest answer as negative sine x over cosine of x. And then moving on to example three. On example three, I'm told some information about cosine, and I'm asked to find sine of x minus pi over two. Well, I don't know what sine of x minus pi over two is, but I do know from one of my formulas above with my co-functions that sine of pi over two minus x equals cosine of x. So if I could somehow rewrite this in this form here, then I could say that it equals cosine of x or negative 0.75. Well, if I look at this, I notice this and this are almost the same. They're, op they're opposites. Positive pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative x, positive x. So I'm going to factor a negative 1 out, making this become sine 
negative 1 x minus pi over 2. Excuse me, I'm writing the same thing. Negative x plus pi over 2. When I know with sine, if there's a negative, I can pull it out to the front since it's an odd function, giving me negative sine of, and it doesn't matter what order I write this in as long as I keep the same signs. Well, as I just pointed out, sine of pi over 2 minus x is cosine of x. So this is then the same thing as keeping that negative, negative cosine of x. Well, cosine of x is negative 0.75, so a negative, negative 0.75 becomes just 0.75. Example 4 is very similar to example 3. In fact, I'm going to do almost the exact same thing. I first noticed that I don't have a formula for x minus pi over 2, the cosine of that, but I do have a formula for cosine of pi over 2 minus x. That's equal to sine of x. So once again, if I could rewrite this in this form, I could then substitute sine of x or negative 0.37x or 0.37 in. So again, I notice they're exact opposites, so all I'm going to do is factor a negative 1 out, giving me negative x plus pi over 2. Since cosine is an um, even function, I know that this negative, cosine of a negative, is the exact same thing as cosine of a positive. So that negative essentially just disappears and I end up with cosine of pi over 2 minus x, which is equal to sine of x, which according to this information here is equal to negative 0.37. And finally, looking at the last two, these are going to be referencing some of my Pythagorean identities. One thing that you always want to kind of be aware of is if you see a trig function squared and a 1 or 2 trig function squared, go to your Pythagorean identities. So because I see this 1 and this cosine squared, I go to my trig identities and I notice that I have the identity that sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. Well, I could subtract a cosine squared from both sides. Doing that would give me sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine squared x. So when this asks me what trig function is represented by this, notice that that is appearing right here and is equal to sine squared x. And finally, the last example, very similar to example 5. What value is represented by cotangent squared x minus cosecant squared x? Again, I see two trig functions being squared, so that immediately tells me to look to my Pythagorean identities. And I see that one of my Pythagorean identities is that cotangent squared x plus 1 equals cosecant squared x. So notice I want to be subtracting a cosecant squared from cotangent squared. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to subtract this cosecant squared from both sides, giving me cotangent of x minus cosecant squared x plus 1 equals 0. So how am I going to get cotangent squared and cosecant squared alone? I'll subtract 1 from both sides. And notice when I do that, I'll be left with cotangent squared x minus cosecant squared x equals negative 1. So what value is represented by this? The value would be negative 1. So again, you will not have to memorize these other than having to know this one here. Um, but you do have to be able to recognize them and notice that, hey, I recognize that this looks a lot like one of my co-function identities. Hey, I recognize that this is looking like it may be coming from one of my Pythagorean um, identities. So make sure again that you either have all those written down or you've printed out the note sheet and you have that handy so you can use it as that reference guide as you're working through problems like these.